recording. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order then. I just got a message saying it's being recorded, Kate. So I guess we're good. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I have two sets of minutes that need to get approval this week if we can do it. I got your changes, Janet, and um, I have the ability to share, share them out if you want to, but I've accepted all the changes that you made in, into it. They were, they were mostly tiny grammatical or spelling mistakes. There was one, one name that was missing. Um, which yeah, it was a map. Does anybody happen to know who that was? Uh, I think that was about the schools, if I remember right. Three. Uh, I can't remember. So that was last that week? Was, last that was, oh, was that October or last month? Let me switch over to... It was, it was um, the October meeting. Uh, so okay. Jerry updated the group on the CMS building plan. He said that he'd been working with Matt. And Root. Root. Right. Root. R-O-O-T. Yep. Um, which is misspelled. So one of the things is misspelled. I'm determined that we get Jane Hodgkiss' name um, spelled correctly. That. Yeah, I... <laughs> How do you spell that? It's P-C. Nobody knows. J-A-N-E. H-O-T-C-H-K-I-S-S. I thought we corrected that. Well, it was corrected uh, in October minutes, and I've corrected again in the, the November one was missing a T or something, but. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I like that, right? There's also a, the paragraph about it. It, when it talks about the, who was there, it says Hodge rather than Hodge again. Yeah. So scroll up. Also present were Kate Hanley, Jane Hodge, Kiss, and Jake Swenson. You see what I mean? To change it. Hold on. Where? Oh yeah. Oh, first paragraph. Bottom line. First paragraph. It isn't. It, the spelling isn't obvious. <laughs> it's H O T C H. K I S S. Yep. Okay. And then. Oops. Great. Hmm. Yeah, so um, I think I've sent versions with this, uh, the, with these spellings and, the, and uh, any incidental changes. You sent it to me and I think just Doug. Okay, yeah. And those were, at, yeah, I read through, there was nothing substantive. It was nothing adding um, a URL here or there and, and spelling um, omissions or mistakes. Great job. On the minutes? Great job. Thank you. So who, who are you taking minutes, Root. Karen? Root. <laughs> I, I guess so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I'm as good at taking minutes, I'd do it, but I really am not. Who's, who is taking minutes today? I will. Thank you. Okay. Um, assuming that we have these correct at this point, do I have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Hold on one second on that page you've got. Uh, right down the bullet that starts with Brad. You've got Charlie, Matt, and Jerry. Maybe we need the last names. Charlie Parker, presumably. Yeah. Right. Matt Root and Jerry Frankel, I, I guess, is <laughs> the right people. Yeah. And Kate, yeah. can we? both of these at one time or do we have to make two separate motions? I know, I think you have to spell that differently. It's, it's friend kill, I think. Yeah, F-R-E-N-K-I-L. Everybody misspells it. Okay. Yes, I know I've been guilty of that. Yeah. Okay, so, so that was that one. 
and this is the, the I think the November 19th ones were all right. I accepted all those changes that you had in there too. Okay. Assuming it's okay, then I would yeah. say we're good to go. Okay, I'll make the remake the motion to approve uh, October 1st. Okay. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Make a motion to, will somebody make a motion to approve the November minutes? I'll uh, make a so motion moved. to approve the November minutes. Second. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Okay. Now, according to somebody yesterday, you can't you can't actually be part of the meeting without having your video on. Is that is that actual policy or was that cab policy? Well, I'm trying to get my video going. I'm <laughs> I've got some display problem. So uh, no, it's certainly nicer to see people's faces, but yeah, I don't I'm know. trying. And so. Um, you can drive right. by phone. Probably don't have to see people's faces. I don't. I don't, right. I don't know. Kate, do you know the ruling of that? Well, what I heard last what I heard last night was that if they want to make commentary in the meeting that gets put into the minutes, then mm -hmm. they have to have their video running. They're just listening. They don't need to. Okay, we seem to carry all together now. I think it's good best practice for all the committee members to have their video on. Anyway, I'm going to uh, exit the meeting and come back in, see if I can get the video working that way. Okay. So, uh, see you in a minute. <laughs> I didn't mean to cause trouble. <laughs> yes, you oh, did. God. <laughs> well, are we all good about um, the next meeting being on January 21st? That's the next topic. That's uh, the third Thursday in January. I think so. I'm sure. So let's see. Kate cannot attend because she's going to be on vacation. So I hope, where are you going to be, Kate? Um, not here. <laughs> okay, I won't. Uh, no comment then. Okay. If there's no snow days, there's no vacation. Is there? Just... <laughs> I know it's a weird time to think about vacation, but I'm going to take a week off. Um, Good. But Good I, confirmed, I confirmed that um, Jeremy can start the Zoom meeting for you. So you can Thank you. still have your meeting, no problem. Okay. Just I need his email and his phone number so that okay. I can communicate with him. Who's Jeremy? Um, Jeremy. Jeremy works in the town manager's office. Is that, if I send it to town clerk, does he get it? No. Yeah, I don't I don't have his email address, but that's all right. You send it to me. I'll send it to you, yeah. Okay, so we're good on that. And I'm, the question came up in my mind whether we should identify tentatively a date for February, but I, again, are we, I was on track pretty much with that third Thursday. Is that going to work for those of you that are out there now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's shoot for that. We'll cover that again. And now it's your turn to give a director's report. Kate, you have anything? I took some notes uh, that you had. Um... I, I sent to everyone an, an a written report um, yesterday, I think. Um, so I can just kind of touch on those things. Um, the biggest thing that I've been working on was passing a new vehicle policy for the town fleet. Um, so the select board approved that unanimously on Monday, which is great. Um, and that policy updates, you know, we had a, a fuel efficient vehicle policy that some of you may have even been involved in back when we first became a green community. Um, that required us to meet certain, you know, town vehicle purchases or leases to meet certain fuel economy standards. Um, but we updated that to be a electric first policy. So the idea is that first, all new vehicles should consider an electric option, um, then a plug-in electric option, then a hybrid, and then the last resort is a conventional vehicle. Um, 
So that policy was adopted, it's in place. Um, and we're already, a lot of the town departments are already really doing that, which is great. Um, and we um, actually deployed three new uh, Nissan Leafs in the last month, uh, one of which is going to be a, um, or it's already in operation as a driver's ed vehicle. So driver's ed students will get to drive a Nissan Leaf, which I think is really exciting. Um, and then we also deployed one for Minuteman Media Network and the facilities department has one too. So um, we're already kind of putting that into place. And I think the last thing I put in my update was just that the middle school committee uh, is meeting again. The committee was paused in the spring, but it has been restarted and met for the first time since that break uh, last week. And so I'll keep you all posted on, on those meetings now that they're uh, happening again. And the next one's gonna be the first week of January, I believe. Jerry, were, was Jerry, were you involved with that committee when it was going? Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't involved with the building committee directly, but I am working with two members of the sustainability subcommittee, which are Charlie Parker and Matt Root, as we discussed previously. Um, and I, I have a very brief update on that, which I, I can just add right now, which is not much of an update. <laughs> um, the, as far as I know, the sustainability subcommittee has not uh, started meeting again yet. Um, the, we recently, about a month ago, we had a meeting, or maybe three or four weeks ago, I forget. We had a meeting with, we meaning uh, Matt Root, Charlie Park and I met with Dave Wood. And the next step there, actually, let me back up a second. Uh, in that meeting, we established a framework for deciding on um, a net zero energy building and the PV that would be associated with it. Uh, Dave is on board with the framework that we suggested. The next step, which I do not know if it has occurred yet, was he was going to meet with uh, Lori Hunter and uh, see if they were both in sync. Um, because he, he said basically he doesn't he doesn't want to get involved unless she's on board. So I don't know if they've met, uh, but I think that's the next step is to find out where, what the status of that is. And I'll take that action to go figure that out and report back by the next meeting. Are you going to be attending that meeting in January? That meeting, meeting the middle school meeting that Kate mentioned. Um, I don't know yet. Um, it, it's, I hadn't really thought about it yet, <laughs> but yeah. uh, the answer is probably. Okay. Um, Kate, what was the, the date of that meeting? December 7th. No, the next one. It's a Thursday, December 7th. I'm sorry, January 7th. Okay. Yeah, I'll plan on being there. Is, is that a Zoom meeting too? Yes, everything's a Zoom meeting. It's at 7.30 in the morning. Oh, brother. How does one get, is, are the links for that posted in the, in the agendas? Yeah, all the, all the town committee meetings are posted to the town calendar and the agendas have to be posted at least 48 hours in advance and all the agendas include the Zoom links. So you can find the meeting that you want and go to the agenda and access the, the Zoom link. I haven't been able to completely navigate the town calendar, but I'll, I'll work that out. Okay. Anything else, uh, Kate? No, nothing else for me. Now let's go to the planning board liaison update, Karen. Anything new in that department? Um, I guess probably not new, but um, it was interesting to listen to the discussions on um, uh, the, I think they've had three meetings since we were, uh, we last met, but I only sat in on two of them. And a lot of the discussion um, focused around electric buildings and EV charging in uh, the, um, these upcoming mixed use developments, one in West Concord, one at the um, Thoreau Depot. And um, 
the it was interesting to hear the developer of the um, the West Concord uh, development talk about while he philosophically agrees with um, the all electric buildings, they're sort of at the tail end of their three year project and it's a bit late to, to, to do this now. And he, he came back to the, the board and said that, you know, there's still this perception out there um, that the end user incurs, incurs more cost for all electric. And he also said that um, a lot of the architects all have dissenting views on this. Um, and he mentioned that uh, the leasing folks are saying that it's still a negative connotation for all electric. So there's clearly this perception out there that that still needs to be changed. And I think, um, you know, the the uh, CSEC campaign that, that Brad outlined for us at the last meeting, I think will go a long way to helping residents and potential residents um, become more informed about um, home heating and electrification of, of their, their homes and everything. And I'm wondering if there might be a, a tangential role, I don't know, to, to educate developers as well. Um, I have no idea what that would look like, whether it might be a case study or a CMLP um, uh, cost analysis or something. But, um, you know, the board argued to the developer, you know, it's much cheaper to heat houses with heat pumps. Um, the technology is there, it's way ahead of where it used to be, um, but clearly the perception has not caught up to the reality of the technology yet. So, is that, is so that, that was interesting. Is, is, I mean, what's that, uh, I'm just curious. I think, I actually think it is more expensive if you look at it at total cost. I'm experiencing that in my own case too. Yeah, it is. In the long run, the heating, well, if you look at 30 years, perhaps, but if you look at it at a 10 year window, which is sort of what, you know, usually what most people residences are unless they move, right? Because depending on their family status and stuff like that, right. it's more expensive because you have a big capital outlay at the beginning, right? And, and then you only recover that over the long, long run. And it needs to be a long run, I think. Right. Hmm. Is, is you talking about, um, retrofitting an existing building or building a new building with let's look at the reality i mean unless you're building a 5000 square feet house which is basically what the only buildings that are happening in, in concord today <laughs> by and large um you know you are you have the vast majority of the population is retrofitting well that's true but yeah. they were talking about the new project in west concord and Somewhere. Right. These I'm are two. Well, maybe, maybe, but I'm just talking about the general comment about the perception. I think the perception is not restricted to new buildings. I think it's a general perception. I think. Right. I think it's yes. A particular instance with the planning board and the and the builders, right. the architects. Right. And Part of the perception. I think, I think part of the end, you know, there's a fear that the end unit users are going to say, "I don't want to cook an electric stove." That Whereas too. If that's you, a, that's if a preference, you, right? Well, yeah. it is, but if, you, if anybody who's experienced induction cooking will realize it's as fast or faster, and it you that so easy to clean. It doesn't have clean a cleaner gas stove is you know we've got all those yeah. I don't know funny shapes and you've got to get around and get clean and it's right. Whereas an induction cooktop is just wipe it down. I think part of the issue here might be that there's no uh, standardized or generally accepted way of computing the costs. Mm. Right. So, you know, some people could look at it from a perspective of 10 years, pay, uh, lifetime, others maybe a 30 year lifetime. And you you could very well end up with opposite perspectives, opposite um, Right results you know one might be more expensive one might be less so so everyone could be correct here um one thing we might do um this may not fit in with our overall strategy and vision but if we showed a standardized way of computing the cost it may help to dispel uh some of this uncertainty about which one's really more expensive I, right. I just want to jump in and share that just a few just Recently, in the last couple of months, um, Rocky Mountain Institute put out an update to their cost of new construction for all electric homes. And one of the cities they looked at was Boston. 
And so they followed a methodology looking at the 15 year, I think Doug's pulling this up, net present costs, um, as well as the upfront cost and the annual um, operating costs. And they found that the upfront costs for an all electric versus a mixed fuel home, so something that had gas and electric is cheaper for all electric in the Boston area. Um, obviously the emissions reduction is significant and the net present cost is less, though the annual electricity costs would be slightly more than a mixed fuel home. And that's using Boston electricity prices. So I've actually talked to Jan just yesterday about whether we can um, do a similar analysis for using Concord electricity prices. So we have yeah. the data points. I've um, done those before. When this comes up. Can we share that article with the planning board so they have that information? It, yeah, it's already been shared with them. Is that for new construction? Yes. If anybody wants that document that I showed you, that it's available on our meeting materials folder. So I, I've for done that analysis for last for, month's meeting for Concord, and uh, it depends on um, your heat pump efficiency, which is which varies widely. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, and but under optimistic conditions, it is less. It is more expensive than gas, hmm. even at CMLP's prices. But it's arguably less expensive than the other fuels. Um, it's unfortunate. But, uh, what um, that's the new construction, uh, Brad? For new construction, now you always have to assume that that means air conditioning plus heating. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, for new construction, it's a little bit of a fudge because uh, if you want to compare spec house built they're going to put in the cheapest furnace that they can get away with and it's going to be installed by some person just out of trade school and you're comparing it with a heat pump house is done by a, a more expensive crew right. and top of the line equipment so there's a little bit of uh, fudging there uh, potentially uh, yeah, i mean i I've, I've I think I agree. I mean, I think having a benchmark yeah. or something that we can compare to and we can communicate, I think is very useful. Yeah. Um, but I think that benchmark needs to be both um, new and retrofit, right? Great. Uh, um, I, I'll give you my own personal example. I've looked three times at putting solar panels and I just couldn't get myself to bite the, bite the bullet. It's just no way. <laughs> My electric monthly bill is one hundred dollars a month, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I, it's just personal example. Of course, there are other considerations, right? I mean, but but still, I think it's uh, it's good to have, and um, it's almost cheaper. And I think almost the idea, the argument is to have, you know, Plan A, Plan B, Plan C, and try and get people walk them through what are the options. And you don't need to have solar panels, but you take, can take other actions to try and diminish your, your carbon yeah. output, right? One thing that I think it, along that line, Haney, that is really important, it, like the plan A, plan B, plan C, if people have worked out a choice plan about what direction they're gonna go, so that they don't have to make that choice in an emergency when a, a system fails. A lot of times decisions get made about retrofitting or something when there's a problem. And right. usually it's, that creates crisis and instead of being able to fall into a plan. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good point, right? So I, again, I'm gonna give you another example because I went through these cho the choice and decisions and when to. Um, we have, we converted from oil to gas back uh, 20 plus years ago. Right um, now we have this gas furnace that's old by today's technology. So now the question is, okay, then we put it back on the table to reconsider what do we do, right? Um, and gas furnace is, you know, good efficient one nowadays is what about ten, twelve thousand dollars, something like that, all in, and compare it to alternatives. And that would be another scenario to look at potentially. I think to my to your point, Douglas, right? 
uh, is how do you compare? What is what is the, the appropriate model to look at? Right. And um, yeah, to make a long story short, coupling this with solar or something like that at the same exactly. time exactly. can make the economics good, uh, but you have to, uh, it gets complicated. So a big part of what I wanted to talk about is how do we do that sort of, how do we do this sort of pricing model? Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly, because anybody can make up numbers. I'm really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a difference between the, the air source heat pump and the ducted horse, air source heat pump, you know, choices. That, like there are a lot of range of choices depending on the kind of yeah. houses that are being considered. And one size does not fit all, that is for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think Brad has the most experience in advising people on this. Of the do, you, do you want to, shall we move on to the CMLP liaison update? Do you want to say something, Jerry? Um, yeah, I'll just uh, briefly report on the last uh, CMLP meeting. Um, so, uh, Dave Wood reported that uh, CMLP is looking at uh, batteries, uh, battery providers, um, and uh, their motivation is, there is two motivations. One is to improve reliability in town and also to uh, uh, remove or mitigate the constraint um, where one of the circuits cannot uh, tolerate any more solar in town. Um, they're limited on that circuit because during certain days, I think it's uh, sunny days in the springtime, the uh, solar produces uh, actually more energy than is consumed. And that means that the current begins to flow back into the, uh, um, through the substation into the main uh, distribution uh, transmission grid, and that'll cause problems. So I was pleased to hear they're, they're uh, beginning to look at it. They're hoping to move forward in 2021. And in the next month or two, he plans to bring a proposal to uh, the CMLP board to talk about. Right. Yeah, I was pleased to hear that. Uh, it's a slower timetable than I would like, but nonetheless, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, does, so does he have a plan of where those batteries are going to be put? Uh, he didn't talk about that. Okay. Uh, I presume that will be uh, part of his proposal to the board. Do you know how big a battery, uh, industrial scale battery is talking about? Like how many megawatts of battery is it? Um, two to five megawatts uh, in terms of power and uh, somewhere between four to 20 megawatt hours. So then it would be a farm then or something like that? Um, well, again, this is just the battery size. This is not solar. Right. So um, you need multiple batteries, right? Yeah, you'd need multiple batteries, but that th those are fairly common sizes. Uh, nothing unusual there. I'm guessing that they would put it uh, probably on the uh, the WR Grace property, but that's just my my speculation. Right. The other interesting topic from the CMLP meeting is uh, uh, they're considering. Uh, extending a nuclear power contract that uh, they currently have. Uh, they've got a couple of options for it. One is to extend it for six years. Another is to extend it for uh, 10 years. Um, the good news about that is that uh, a non-emitting source. Um, the bad news about it is it's nuclear, which is controversial. Um, the source for the nuclear would be uh, um, Seabrook. Seabrook. Yeah. Um, if the uh, ten-year deal was approved, that would bring the nuclear portion of Concord's portfolio to thirty-five percent through twenty twenty-nine. So um, that's still up in the air. They're still evaluating it. Um, I'm not sure when or how that decision will be made, but there there was discussion of the portfolio and particularly uh, these two nuclear options. You mean the non-emitting part of the portfolio would be 35%? No, the nuclear portion. Oh, the nuclear part. So the non-emitting portion would be larger than that. That's it for my CMLP update.
Thank you. Um, Brad, do you want to speak to the Mass Energize update? Uh, sure. Uh, first, I wanted to mention uh, something um, uh, more of an announcement that uh, we're in January on the 19th. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be a webinar called uh, Zero Carbon Home offered by a guy named David Green. I don't know if anybody's heard of him, but he's somebody we've yeah. met through the uh, Heat Smart Alliance. And it's going to be sponsored by the First Parish Environmental Team in uh, Concord, Can. Uh, the essential thing is how, by investing in weatherization, heat pumps, and solar PV, uh, all at once or like in tandem, you can get your home, your, your carbon footprint for your home energy to zero and have a good return on investment. Um, and I sat in on one of his webinars. He's, he's a little bit self-promotional. You can, don't have to put that in the minutes. Uh, and he started with a home energy bill of $11,000 per year, <laughs> which is pretty funny. But if you start with a home that costs $11,000 a year to heat, it's unbelievable how much money you can save. Um, so, uh, but he's, uh, we could publicize it or I just wanted to tell you about it. Uh, um, Have you gonna... started publicizing it yet, Brad? I'd love to put it in the newsletter and- That would be great. Uh, so I, I have some, a blurb I can send you that uh, okay. Bob Andrews wrote up. Great. When, uh, when is that? It's gonna be the 19th of January and it's gonna be at some time of day. Ooh, I guess I don't remember what time of day it is, but um, uh, I, I guess I could find that out, but I don't remember. Does everybody get the Con Concord Can um, newsletter update? No. Yeah. No. Well, I recommend it. <laughs> okay. And if anybody wants to get that, I can put people on the list. Oh, yeah. I would love that. I would love okay. that. Yeah. Sign me up, Brad, please. Brad, me too, please. Uh, Bob. Okay. Got it. Okay. It's 7 to 8 p.m. on the 19th. Okay, good. Oh. Um, 19th is anyway, so, Saturday. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I learned at that cab meeting, by the way, which I thought was interesting, or we haven't gotten to the cab meeting but in the future. Never mind. Um, so I don't have much to update on Mass Energize. Been working hard at a number of things. We still have a monthly communities meeting that uh, Janet and I have both been attending. And sometimes it's quite interesting uh, to hear about different topics. This month we heard from uh, Mass CEC about their new uh, uh, decarbonization pathways program that uh, is of relevance to see uh, to us, I think. Um, I'll say something about it in a little bit. Uh, I have I have some a few pictures of that too that I was going to touch on, Brad. So some of the slides that were from that that were of relevance, I thought we could share them. Oh, okay. So you got that? Yeah, I, I have. I, I didn't get the whole thing. I got part of it. Okay, um, and then um, the. Um, Still haven't been promoting the, the local Cooler Concord site, but have, have um, updated a lot of the con content. So it's about ready and I, uh, we should start promoting at the beginning of the year. And at the last CSEC meeting, we asked people to check it out and maybe create a profile, try it out and give feedback. And I think at least one person did, <laughs> but two. <laughs> um, and I've worked on it earlier. So. Right Anyway, um, so we'll, uh, I, I'm going to put out a newsletter uh, at the beginning of the year and start to promote it through different groups in town, get some traction. Um, and that's about it. Uh, can you say something about, maybe, I don't know if you intended to, to say it here, but there were those two sites that you had given us links to, um, and I think I have them right. handy. So, 
There's a really good, so on the Mass CEC uh, has done a, pro, uh, a great site called uh, Clean Energy Lives Here. Called Mass, uh, Clean Energy Lives Here. There we yeah. go. So this, this is what it looks like. Really good. This is um, a very good version of what we were trying to do with our uh, in, our future sustainable home, really. And there, this is statewide. It's being well promoted by uh, um, a bunch of uh, you know social media, etc. And it's got great resources on it, so you can go down and you can read about. Uh, heat pump water heaters or, sol or EVs and things like that. I think their material is great. And most of this site or a lot of it was done by uh, Susan Melodizenik, who is a Concord resident, who's their uh, um, director of marketing, or she, at least she was quite involved with this. So uh, this is not specific to MLPs and maybe there might be things on here where uh, that are a little bit more geared towards investor-owned utilities, but there's a lot of good material here, technical material, and 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 it's very accessible. Um, they're like white papers, sort of, and they're really yeah. well constructed. Right. So to the extent, uh, so I think it's it's good to use this material as uh, an additional resource to residents. Of course, we also have our town's uh, sustainability site that has uh, a bit more Concord specific uh, material and hope and, and also technical material. Hope it's not, hopefully it's not uh, conflicting. Um, so this is, they're gonna keep this site. One of the things that this has is installer lists. So you want to find out about heat pumps, you can put your zip code in and find out who the installers are. And unfortunately, it's, I don't, um, it's whichever installers decided to sign up, show up. So oh. when you put them in, you get a list of five installers, none of them whom are, the, I mean, I'm not going to say that they're bad, but they're not necessarily who've come to top of mind of, of, of the best installers. Um, so we might want to, you know, I, I've asked Susan to consider reaching out to the, a broader list and saying, you know, you could be on our site. All you got to do is fill out a form and, <laughs> and then you're on the site. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, let people know about this uh, resource. It's quite good. Um, it was um, a second site that you mentioned, decarbonization pathways. But right. I don't have anything out there yet. Right. I ha uh, there's not a site because this is a, a, a grant program in preparation. They got the approval to spend. Uh, I have a, um, a presentation on this that I could share a couple of slides from, if you like, uh, that we had uh, given to us. Uh, the other night. So this is about how do we do whole home decarbonization generally? And so it's exactly what we're, what we're thinking about. Although there, um, should I show a couple of slides from that? You can. Sure. Okay, so let me uh, take that screen. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put that there, share. And uh, so here is the presentation. Uh, oh, did that work? Okay. So this is uh, decarbonization pathways, um, and um, so they've, as I said, this is how do we get people off of fossil fuels? They have a very nice cartoon, just like we made. God, we spent a lot of time making that uh, cartoon house, uh, but. Uh, so they want to develop best practices that balance weatherization, electrification, and operating cost. Uh, developing and testing protocols for decarbonization assessment and transition planning. With the $2 million, they want to target 75 to 100 assessments and plans. So it's not trying to reach big parts of the state. It's trying to figure out, trying to design the assessment process 
get some homes done. Uh, so, and uh, it's, um, I'd really like to see if we can possibly make access of this grant uh, funding, because this is really what we, what we want to do. How do you reach those people and give them something useful to tell them how to get from here to there? Um, and let's see. Um, so it's a total of $2 million for the pilot. They plan to spend a quarter of it for consulting and vendor support and the rest of it mostly for incentives for homeowners. Um, ideally, you'd like to test the waters and figure out how much does it cost to get people to actually do this stuff. Uh, and it, it probably costs more than the rebates that we're offering uh, because in general, I mean, what uh, I've heard from National Grid is if, if you pay for like 50% of the upfront cost, then people start getting really quite interested in it. Uh, and we're, we're more like at the 10% uh, uh, level or, or less. Uh, anyway, that's kind of, I can share this presentation because it's a, it's a public presentation at this point. There's another grant program called Empower Massachusetts, which is about uh, inequitable energy burden and access to clean energy, which is quite interesting. It's not as relevant to us, although we do have um, homeowners that are energy burdened, uh, but it, it, um, there's, they're more thinking about uh, gateway communities and how do, you, how do you help them promote uh, clean energy into their communities. Can you save this into the meeting materials space? Yeah. I'm going to send. I want. I want to uh, send a package with everything that I have. But I mean, just save it into that CSEC meeting materials place for today's meeting. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. okay so that was pretty much that. Thanks. Um, I will give you my thing back. Do you have anything to say about the HeatSmart update? Um, yeah, a bit. Um, so, um, sorry to take up the whole meeting with that, but uh, so we, I, I mentioned uh, the last meeting that CMLP has been doing this work with the Bode Energy Management, which I think is really quite exciting. And they're gonna be actually working with a total of six municipal light plant communities doing uh, um, free consultation, reviews of heat pump installations, uh, and um, managing an approved vendor list as well. Um, we had a meeting with uh, Bob Zog and I met with uh, Travis, who, uh, Estes, who runs the uh, program there, and Christopher Haringa, who is our local person, uh, who you would get on the phone if you wanted to consult with somebody about heat pumps. Uh, great, I think it's a great operation. It's, it's um, I think it should help out quite a bit. Um, so we've been working on uh, coaching, uh, uh, coaching methods within the HeatSmart Alliance and Abode is gonna be running a training in January for people who wanna become uh, home energy coaches that can talk about heat pumps. And that uh, I'm just mentioning this because it would be good to have one or two other people from CSEC that were, or if they were interested to, uh, to do this training. Uh, is the training? The training well, is, it hasn't been well, scheduled, but it'll be in January. One of the things that I've asked about in regards to this training and, and about energy in general, I asked Jana Setti if, she would be willing to come and present for 10 or 15 minutes to, uh, to give us an overview of what's been done in January, the January meeting, if that's uh, something that you guys agree would be valuable. Do I, do I, I have a, does could that be, seem could be good. Like a good thing to add into our agenda? Uh, I'm, I'm confused because uh, the CMLP is uh, is is working with Adobe and I believe two coaches. 
So um, is right. the heat smart? Is, I mean, is that the same program that you're talking about, Brett? <laughs> there, it's not exactly the same program, but it, uh, it's complementary. So in most of the towns that the Heat Smart Alliance is in, aren't participating in that. Um, whereas in Concord, because they're providing two paid coaches, I'm going to do very little coaching aside from what we end up doing as part of this uh, program we're trying to uh, uh, dream up. Um, now, uh, so the abode thing is not specifically about, you know, how to weatherize your house or something like that. And I think we're, we should be thinking more in terms of uh, a little upstream from what abode does um, to make your house ready to be electrified, as well as what the options are that you might want to consider before we send you over to abode to, to find out more. Um, I'm looking, I had a copy of the abode memo that Jan sent us, but I don't have it right handy. Okay. Um, I mean, depending yep. on the time it takes, I'm, I, I would be interested for some. Okay, that's okay. great news. Yeah. Um, I will get uh, back to you on that. Okay. Okay, so the other thing that uh, Heat Smart Alliance has been working on that's quite interesting is just uh, performance, uh, modeling and performance of systems. And um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, sizing is an issue. Uh, if you put in a, a, a furnace, you just put in a nice a furnace with a big capacity and it's going to heat your house just fine. Um, and as you know, heat pumps can be very efficient if they run right. And under laboratory co uh, conditions is where they measure heat pump efficiency. They're, you know, two or three, three times more efi efficient than a fossil system or, an, or a conventional electric system. But that's assuming it's running in a reasonable range. And if you, uh, so there's a, um, there'll be a range of temperatures for, for your house where a heat pump will operate between its minimum and maximum capacity. And if that range of temperatures is, let's say between five degrees and 30 degrees, that's great. Uh, because that means during a big chunk of the winter, the heat pump's gonna be working efficiently. But if you were to put in a heat pump that's twice the size, then you'll find out that uh, it actually is, is very poorly suited to the house and it will only operate for a few minutes and then cycle off and they'll cycle on and cycle off. And it turns out that the, uh, whereas uh, a heat pump, a well-designed heat pump with a coefficient of performance, which means the, uh, of, of let's say two and a half to three, meaning two and a half times more efficient than a conventional electric system can run with a, a coefficient of performance of like one and a half or less. And that makes them very expensive and, and, um, and probably even um, the, they don't run well. And a lot of people, a lot of conventional heating contractors will do that. They don't want to get called in the middle of the night. They just want to put a big system, you know, oversize the system. That's kind of maybe uh, something that they have to be learning to do, not to do. But the typically core, a heat pump, I mean, if the yeah. temperature is below 20 degrees, yeah, it's going to be very hard to get any kind of heating or efficiency out of that. Oh, that's not really, that's not true with the, uh, with the, um, the high quality heat pumps. Hmm. Interesting. Um, the ones run down to minus 13. Right. The ones, yeah, then, this, my house is totally heated by heat pumps and, um, and it's well insulated, but you know, it, there isn't there isn't anything else apart from getting a space heater from the basement, yeah. which I don't do. Well, that's Ooh. interesting. Okay, I mean, that's an, then then opened up the whole broader discussion around what the installers are recommending and right. how do they recommend, right? Which is your point, Brad, right? And you're going to learn a lot about that in January. I, 
I already learned painfully with my installation of the air pump, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm in a situation right now where today, because of this cold temperature and the storm, the heat pump that we put in last year finally went into auxiliary shutdown mode. And we're getting auxiliary heat from another source. And um, it's interesting. We've got some real strange warnings from the heat pump indicating that it was on auxiliary power for a certain amount of time and it was too long, but that was just an advisory note. And also we are having some issues with lower temperatures in the, the rooms that are heated by that heat pump. Okay. I want to come over and check that out. I'll bring my skis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, any more comments um, from no. the heat, heat smart update? No. So I, just a question, Brad, what, what sort of modeling are they doing? Um, so we're not trying to be particularly sophisticated. We're, we're trying to model the block loads of houses just from uh, fuel bills, sometimes from a manual J calculation, just to understand building efficiency. And we're also doing some modeling on emissions, trying to understand uh, when you put in the right emission factors for the grid uh, and for uh, including or not including fugitive emissions, how does it compare with uh, natural gas and oil? And thankfully, it, uh, it is less, even with just ISO New England grid, ignoring fugitive emissions, um, it, uh, heat pumps are a lot, uh, a lot lower emissions than, uh, than um, natural gas or oil. So, so the intent of the modeling is to demonstrate in some numerical fashion the emissions benefits of heat pumps? Yeah. I mean, we wanted, to be, we wanted to make sure that the assumptions we were making, we don't want to be recommending it if it's actually no cleaner than, uh, than gas or something like that. And it turns out when you, when you do it carefully, it's... Uh, um, it is. Uh, it's like thirty percent cleaner at today's grid at today's New England grid usage. So when and you say it, today's New England grid usage, you mean the emissions uh, characteristics of guys of New England's portfolio, okay. right? And it depends. You know, it, and it changes whether you call it, whether whether you just say what's generated in Massachusetts or what's imported and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, it. There are some energy geeks that are uh, uh, that have figured this out, and uh, uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to show anybody this these this analysis if they're interested separately. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious at some point. I don't want to take up the rest of the meeting. Yeah. Those, so. Do those models uh, take into account the the cost of extraction and the the loss of, of methane? You know, at the at the at the gas well and the cost of transport trans, transporting oil and the re cost of refiner refining. I'm sure it all doesn't take it all of which will produce emissions yeah. on their own. Right. Um, it probably doesn't do anything perfectly because it's impossible to do things perfectly. But uh, so the the good news is it's cleaner even if you don't take those things into account. So now for comparing gas heating with gas heat pumps, with, with electric heat pumps, there's a fugitive emissions on either because your electricity is partly gas powered and stuff like that. So it gets a little complicated. And then at your home, you have distribution losses that the power plants don't have. And there's no way to figure out what they are anyway. So the good news is it doesn't really matter. Uh, unless you wanted to get super accurate and it's getting super accurate is not, shouldn't be a goal. And who the audience is. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. So we can put it, we can put the fugitive emissions in a footnote that says 
including fugitive emissions doesn't change the result and it you know it gives us a sensitivity analysis stuff like that or a sensitivity uh, factor okay um Janet, do you have anything to say about the EV working group update? Uh, there's just one update, and that is um, that the, the EV pilot program, which is uh, providing, or oh, CMLP is subsidizing uh, installation of, of 240 volt lines to multi unit dwellings. Mildam um, got their estimate which was unbelievably expensive because they have two, two separate parking areas and it's all surface parking. And there's gonna be an enormous amount of trenching. They are not going to do it. They're not, um, you know, they, they withdrawn from the program. CMIP put aside 75,000 for the three projects. Um, they're holding back 25,000 and I'm not quite sure where that's going to go, whether they're going to find another, another um, program. Um, I don't think that slide helps. Um, <laughs> um, and um, the remaining 50,000 is being divided between Concord River Walk and, um, and, and uh, my mind's blanking. I can't see the play, but... Uh, um, another another multi another condominium on Main Street in West Concord. Um, I'll come up with a name. But it Concord can go Green. Later. Concord Green. Thank you. <laughs> no, right. not Concord Green. No, no, not Concord Green. Concord Green is a, they're putting in a charger, which will be a shared charger. Um, Concord, it's not Concord Commons either. It's. Um, Muse? Muse? us in the library. Karen, can you help? <laughs> Is Karen still there? I don't remember. Anyway, I can, I can tell you. It's not coming to mind, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, it's, it's the 50,000 50, is being divided between those two projects. And um, both Karen and I live at Riverwalk and I'm glad we've got the subsidy we just have to we just have to come up with the remaining dollars and to pay for the whole thing yeah. it's a deal <laughs> and okay that's it that's all i need there's nothing else for me to say um one of the things that i had heard about was this thing i put up here that was a link that was sent around by uh Brian Folds, and it was uh, so that that was something that happened um, in November, and I reported on it in the previous meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity to go to the CAAB meeting last night. And uh, with Brad was there too. And they had um, two things that were of significance that I wanted to touch on. One we talked about a little bit, which has to do with the Rocky Mountain Institute for Building Electrification Policies. Um, they, maybe you can comment on this, Brad, just a little bit, but in terms of like what they're trying to do with it, but. It wasn't just the document, but what, what have they been doing with that Rocky Mountain Institute? I'm, I'm part of that group, so I can you give you the Thank overview. You. Um, so Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, I think I shared this last time, has brought together a group of communities in Massachusetts that are interested in building electrification policies. And this is following on the Attorney General's decision that the Brookline um, by law to prohibit new um, um, fossil fuel infrastructure, new construction was not allowed. So um, a group of us in Concord have been looking at what are the actual legal pathways to 
promoting building electrification in new construction. So um, Alice shared an update last night at CAB that we've been, we talked to Tammy Guvea and we'll be talking to Senator Mike Barrett um, after Christmas, just to let them know what we're doing. But the approach is to um, first do a non-binding resolution through the select board, asking the state legislature for help addressing these challenges. Um, and then also um, most likely proceed with a home rule petition at town meeting that would request permission from the state legislature for Concord to be able to, um, to pass a bylaw that would effectively um, encourage building electrification. So that's where we're at in that process. Thanks. And does that need to be a town meeting uh, article? The home rule, rule petition? Yeah, home rule okay. petition does have to go to town meeting. Okay. And I learned... It's called the home rule petition. Yeah. And Lexington is doing that. Uh, probably several communities are, are uh, working on that home rule uh, petition. Yeah, Arlington passed theirs recently. Um, what was the other one that? Um, there was another one I'm blanking on that recently passed um, and Brookline is doing the same. And there's dozens of communities that are part of this accelerator. So I think there'll be more and more. Yeah. Why is it called the home rule petition? That's the, that's the process for, it's not specific to this issue. It's just any, any, um, it, that a municipality wants to be able to legislate on um, that's beyond kind of the state law. So I think we've, Concord has done this for other things in the past. I don't know the details of it. Um, I see Jane is on. I'm not sure if you're active um, and want to chime in here. But. I'm right here. Yep. I'm just, uh, uh, nobody wants to see what I look like having been shoveling for way too long. Oh, yeah. No worries. Um, home rule petition, Jane. That's um, Concord's used that for for other things in the past. Yeah. Yes, we've done that for uh, specifically for the affordable housing um, pieces, and um, you know that hasn't been formally broached by the select board yet as part of this. We we discussed you know the letters gone out and the we looked at the um, and actually I think we supported the. Um, um, the supportive language. I'm trying to, for, it was kind of a, what was the, what vehicle was that? I'm trying to remember now, but it was a, it wasn't a proclamation. It was a, a resolution. Resolution. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Does it allow a municipality like Concord as a, a town itself to do something that is a bypass in effect to a state law? No, that's why we would have to go through a, a, a home rule petition. And, and it actually doesn't, the, um, um, it, it in its current form doesn't do anything. It, it encourages. You cannot bypass state and, and, and federal constitution. Right. You cannot bypass that. It's just a proclamation saying that we want to do this. And right, it, it's sort of the next step towards, it's, it's a knock, knock, here we are. Exactly. We may come with a home rule petition. So and we're not, talking to Tammy and, you know, we're very lucky here because both Tammy and, and Mike Barrett are not only well, well educated and supportive of, you know, any carbon um, reduction opportunities out there. Um, but we're going to also listen to their lead as to, you know, how and when to put this forward. Is the is sense that there that there may be some practices that have to do with decarbonization of homes in the town of Concord that would otherwise not be allowed because of state laws or federal laws? I, I don't know that that's the case. The reason that this whole accelerator has come together is because when Brookline passed their bylaw that prohibited new fossil fuel infrastructure and new construction, the attorney general in their review said, you cannot do that because of state law. Right, it bypassed state law. Right. So the building code is kind of the top 
You know, you can't go, can't require anything above and beyond the state building code. Hmm. Oh, and this will give them a way to get around that. No, that would be that would be a proclamation saying we want to do that and we need to establish a political process to change the state law. It's just it's just an announcement and saying the whole town is behind it, basically. Right. And if we did a home rule petition, it might be an exception for Concord. Just as it was when we did um, our affordable housing water. piece, the state didn't adopt that. Yeah. That's we right. were given authority to do it on our own. And that was the housing piece. Yeah, that was to um, it was it was a similar set of language from Sudbury. Uh, Sudbury's work on uh, setting uh, tax money aside for uh, a population of uh, people over a certain age who needed um, tax relief. Okay, okay. I get the idea. So is, is that based on a model? You said Kate is based on the model of um, Rocky Mountain Institute? Rocky Mountain Institute is providing support by bringing together, um, you know, technical resources, community engagement resources, oh, and the experience of other communities that are all trying to go for the same goal. Okay. And they're focused on on Massachusetts, so at least it's we're dealing with the same state law in each of these communities. Versus, I mean, RMI works all over the country, so. Yeah. Yeah, so they've brought in, for example, some lawyers to look at Massachusetts state law and the you know, attorney general's ruling on Brookline to say, okay, given Massachusetts, what can cities and towns in Massachusetts do? Okay. Okay. Good. The other thing um, that... Uh, happened at the meeting that um, I wanted to share a few slides from that I was able to capture was the CMLP strategy for decarbonization, car carbonizing their electric supply. It was a fascinating uh, um, presentation. Um, let me see if I can get this. You start with the con. This is what they talk about: high-level CMLP dark decarbonization strategy, in-town solar behind the meter, and solar rebates. How CMLP purchases power, and the implementation of contracted power purchases that include RECs, with interim strategies for purchasing RECs. Some of that REC purchasing process really complicated and. I don't. I didn't totally follow it, but uh, it was very interesting to get some of the background for this. I, I'm familiar with the rec trading and how to procure those. Okay. And they're all different types of classes. I assume that they're going to get Massachusetts Class One renewable solar, energy yeah. certificates. And those 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 right now cost between four and six cents a kilowatt hour, in addition to what our standard rate will be. So yeah. Our, our power will be more expensive to green our supply by purchasing RECs. Some, yeah. of, the, some of these are just, I just took a, a select couple of the slides. I don't have all of them, but maybe uh, would it be possible, um, Kate, to get a copy of the, the full presentation? Anyway, their strategy. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, like this meeting, the CAB meeting was recorded. So it will be, if it's not on YouTube yet, it was just yesterday, it will definitely be there. So you can watch the, the full presentation if you want. Okay. And isn't um, the strategy at the website, CMLP's website? Yep, their, um, their strategic plan is on their website. But this was beyond, this is an, this presentation was done after the strategic plan and it's recent, was presented by Dave Wood and um, what was the other woman's name? Laura. Laura Scott. Scott, who is one of their specialists in energy buying and processing. 
Um, so their decarbonization strategy is around the idea of providing 100% non-emitting electricity by 2030. And um, they're interested in investing in town in town solar generation more, although there seem to be a number of limitations to getting to that place really very rapidly. Um, and they're also in, very engaged in providing a range of rebates and incentives to supply support the beneficial electrification and energy efficiency. Right. Here is another slide. Um, can you, is this big enough to see or should I, maybe I should make this bigger. What, do, you, do you see it okay? Yeah, I can, it's a little hard, but I can read. Let me see. Um, I, I can read it. Okay. This is to show Concord's behind the meter photovoltaic capacity and they've gotten up to four megawatts apparently in residential and non-residential solar PV generating capacity in the CMLP system. Um, wow. It's a combination of third party PPA capacity at 6.4 megawatts and behind the meter PPA solar totals totaling 10.2 megawatts. I got a question that was too boneheaded to ask yesterday, but what does behind the meter mean? So I can it explain means... that. Oh, Good. go ahead, Doug. Hey, Jerry, either way. So um, it, it's, it means exactly what it says. Okay. It is, if, if, you, if you look at the location of PV from the perspective of CMLP, then okay. you, the, the question is, is the PV, on what side of a user's meter is the PV located? Oh, okay. So all residential net metered solar is behind the meter. Yeah. And some commercial solar, if we had it, would be behind the meter, but some might be up front if CMLP was participating. Right. Got it. Okay. I don't know, Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the projects our company did, some some have their own meter, so those would not be a considered behind the meter project. If that makes, okay. Yep. Some of the projects just feed onto the grid without oh. being behind a commercial meter. If there was a roof, to, if there was a PPA that was like a solar rooftop that was uh, in the parking lot of the high school or something like that, or in the new middle school, something would those be considered behind the meter? Depends on how it's wired up. And, and, the, and the way now the way the decision's made, it depends on the rate class of the off taker. Because you can maximize your revenue depending on the rate class of the existing site. So it varies. Right. In in the case of CMS, there one of the issues in going forward here with PV is really, will it be in front of the meter or behind the meter? If it's behind the meter, um, basically it implies that the school has to manage that. Um, and comments from that I've heard from, uh, or at least I've heard attributed to building committee members is they don't wanna get involved in any of that. So, the implication is it would go in front of the meter, in which case CM, uh, CMLP would manage it. And because CMLP doesn't directly manage any of these PV installations, there would be a contract with a PPA provider. Right, because so, they could get tax credit. Yeah. And that's where you had this issue about batteries and stuff like that, right? Yeah. The discussion. Well, batteries factor into that. Um, Dave Wood wants to see, which I'm thrilled to hear, he wants to see a battery as part of that system on either side, whether they end up with a behind the meter uh, installation or in front of the meter. But he wants to see a battery there because it helps him with other issues that CMLP is dealing with. Right. So just keep in mind that when you look at that 10 megawatts, you have to multiply that by 13% 
because that's how much the sun shines during the year and then times 8760 and i got 11,000 kilowatt hours but maybe i'm off by a thousand maybe 11 million kilowatt hours yeah so we've batteries are going to be part of the solution obviously but we need a lot more capacity right yeah and there was a town plan to do 25 megawatts of solar that was dreamed up in 2011 but all of this is what Dave would explain yesterday is not, it's not economical yet. It's not happening here. It's happening in other places that are uh, within the renewable energy trust fund, you know, the, the uh, but not here. And it's not, it's not going to necessarily take off. It could be wishful thinking to think that yeah. we got a lot. So he's I referring just, to PV or batteries. Well, he's, it's the combination of the two. Uh, in in uh, in restaurant utilities, you have you have batter incentives just to buy batteries for your home and stuff like that. We don't have that. Uh, or commercial solar, I think uh, they just put they just did a commercial solar project in a on a on a school in Carlisle parking lot. we we don't have that. And, right, uh, it's the the new smart program. The new smart program has incentives for batteries as well. So yeah, but but those and incentives we can't, no, do not apply to to MLP. Right. Yeah. right. I mean, there's a whole pot of money available for investor-owned utilities that we don't right. touch. Right. It's one of the, our big challenges. Well, we have our own pot of money. It, I mean, it all comes from ratepayers. Hmm. All right. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying yeah. it's, it's why we can't it's do a, mass save. Yeah. We can try and. Right. Uh, well, we don't do or, or take from it and create projects as we have with CSEC that look like mass save. Right. We could create our own or could presumably could buy into mass save if they wanted to, but we don't. Here are the programs that CMLP has to reduce carbon emissions right now that they summarize. There was the electric vehicle programs that they have and they're focusing on space and water heating rebates and then solar PV installation rebates and energy efficiency ones. Yeah. Now the uptake on these rebates isn't going very well, right. in my opinion. Um, I kind of agree with Brad. And I think, the, I think it's, more, it's a more fundamental issue around how you look at it. I mean, the discussion around behind a meter, in front of a meter, right? Uh, is a very interesting discussion. It's a little bit like, you know, healthcare for all, and how do you provide still private insurance versus versus Medicare for all, right? A little bit the same kind of discussion. Are all the roofs available to put solar panels, and then the CMLP manages everything, right? And then you have batteries, or do you have private people doing their own thing? Because if not, with a thirteen percent efficiency, then you have a big, big problem. You need massive amount of solar power panels to be able to satisfy the needs of the town right and that's not not in the cars not in the there's car not exactly, enough, there's not right? enough surface area in the town that's, to, that's to, exactly the point uh, right one of the things that they showed was this graph that was very interesting i thought this was one of the more interesting graphs that they showed in the presentation which is sort of a profile of it, it, from 2016 to 2030 projections on the kind of power that they would be buying. And the pink is the nuclear power potentially. And one thing that's interesting is from 2016 to 2021, you can see um, that they, they have contracts out that go through 100% of the power that's needed through it the year. But then as you get out further, they're not making commitments to buying all the power that um, would be needed right. for a variety of reasons. One, that there may, and, and it's in that space that there might be opportunities to buy more renewable power that doesn't exist today. So I'm having a little trouble with this chart. Look at say, well, 2020. So we've got 10% class one, 6% class two, 3% pink, 24%, and then 81% gray. 
That adds up so to the, about 100. What, what so is... the 81 percent and the 24 uh, percent are overlaid. Uh, so out of the 81 percent of emitting power, they managed they bought non-associated RECs for the 20 for the 24. Well, then she, doesn't that mean added, that part of it isn't emitting? Or yeah, but anyway, the number came out of Excel uh, because there's a gray bar that goes down there, and then she just drew the uh, the blue the box blue on top. On top. Of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it does uh, look a little odd. Uh, and they don't know how much power they're going to need in five, ten years because so, they don't know how much. Uh, and and uh, maybe it is immaterial, but what, 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 quickly, what is, does anybody know what is class one and class two? Those are uh, coming with the power that they're buying. So they're uh, um, either hydro or, or methane from uh, waste or, or solar. The class yeah. two ones are from Maine and they're Bangor or, or oh, Maine. That's what they, oh, it's Bangor. M E class two. Okay. Maine class. Okay. So those those are those are renewable or something. Yeah. And he was saying that one of the things that was interesting about the Maine class two wrecks is that the cost of power up in Maine, you know, that's hydropower, even though it's renewable, is a lot less expensive up in Maine than it is because of the transmission costs to bring it down here. More, yeah. A lot more, yeah. yeah. Well, obviously the uh, Canadian hydro story, if that ever comes down to the Massachusetts market, that will, everyone's counting on that so we can meet our goals statewide. Right. Whether yeah. or not that comes through, that's the question. And also of course, offshore wind yeah, not shown here. It's not shown. That's that's why they should. It's a good practice not to purchase all the power in the outlying years, in my opinion. Yeah, that that the offshore wind might fall up in the white area. That's a in the years between twenty three and twenty eight and thirty. Are they projecting Cape Wind to be going on? Um, you know, ready to produce power in twenty twenty three. I think is that right. Not Cape Wind, but the one that's uh, oh, yeah, the, uh, South Vineyard, of Virginia. South of, uh, Block it's Island or wherever it is on, on Mars of Vineyard. The, yeah, it's not okay. Cape Wind, you're right. It's got anyway, to... Jake Swenson was suggesting that he, he had, he's the leader of the CAB, um, that wind power is now supposed to be less expensive than other forms of, you know, even in the nuclear power. I believe well, that yeah. might be true for onshore wind. Offshore is still pretty expensive. That's we're correct. Gonna, yeah. We're going to have fusion power by 2030, though. <laughs> <laughs> there are fusion boats. Well, so that was an interesting graph. This is a sort of a similar graph that I got from Brian Foltz that he showed us after the last meeting. But I, the, it shows the same kind of, it's similar to the last graph. Same graph. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Talk a little bit about their solar power programs and a little bit about the historical CMLP electric load and weather, different years, and different kinds of solar power. What's the, oh, sorry, what was the purple line? Seems to have changed very a lot. That's degree days. That's degree days, okay. And, and no, oh, and it's, it's a very it's, short scale, that's it's why. It's a very short scale. So and, yeah, okay. But, uh... And this just shows a, the a percentage of their carbon-free electricity in the last four right. years. And this is, you know, this business of buying the non-associated wrecks is something nobody's particularly comfortable with, especially when you think out, you have no idea what they're going to cost uh, out in the future. So um, you certainly don't want to plan on those being a big thing. Well, this is not, uh, that's not important. Yeah. Okay. 
So let me just close that. So I don't have a whole lot more to report from the CAV, but those two subject areas were really interesting to get a perspective on it. And I think there's a lot, I felt like I, there was a lot of room for me to get educated in terms of what was going on there a lot better than I have. And it was constructive to learn about it. I, I just remembered the, um, the name of the under, other condominium if you want to put that in the, in the minutes. It's Center Village. Uh, for the EV, okay. um, EV pilot program. Well, now we can come to the part that's the more challenging part is our what our own strategy is going to be going forward. And um, I don't have a lot of slide or material here, but I do have a reference to the material that Brad presented and worked with us with last session. Brad, do you have suggestions on how you want to take this? Um, I'll just tell you what I, I um, what I've been up to, and I, I haven't made a lot of progress that, due to a number of personal reasons. But uh, um, the I kind of rewrote the this one page synopsis of what I think what of what a program would be, and I could share that with you. Okay. Um, this is just draft. It's not anything official. Um, and um, and it uh, opens up many more questions than, uh, than it answers. Um, in a way, we're, we, we, oh, no, not that one, this one here. Um, so I rewrote it as sort of as a, uh, anybody see this screen now? Does that work? It's yeah. small. Yeah. It's small. <laughs> it's a little so small. what you got to do is you have to hit this here uh, and make it 100 and 200 percent. Um, okay. So um, as a problem, I, I kind of rewrote re it as a problem statement, statement in the sense of, OK, we know we need to do something. We need to convince some people, maybe some people with the money uh, or some people that w would allow CSEC plus uh, a larger group to do something. Uh, so what, and uh, so I, the, I've only talked about this with a few people, including uh, Sharon and uh, Gilda Gusson and Mike McIntyre the other day. Uh, and we're trying to get our heads around, you know, what, what sort of collaboration needs to happen and what, what are the ideas that, that uh, or what what outcomes do we want? What uh, what elements are there? And um, so, in, in a nutshell, I'd like to propose propose something like a strategy over five years to start electrifying uh, larger numbers of homes. And um, we we would need to convene a working group to really put some meat on this. And we suggested uh, that it would be a mix of CSEC and CAB and CMLP and citizen stakeholders, ideally managed by uh, Kate, who <laughs> has not nearly enough to do. <laughs> but uh, we we should, you know, bring we should we should uh, formalize these discussions at an earlier stage. I think um, so. Again, this is just rehashing a little bit. Uh, if we want to meet 80% by 2050, we have to get started because it's not all going to happen in the last decade of that. Um, and can I ask why the municip municipality itself is included in these goals? Well, Kate is the municipality. I, I know that, but why? CMLP and citizens. So CMLP is included in it. Uh, now, the one question is, should CMLP own it? That's maybe, an open question. Maybe we need to ask Bob, I think it was Bob, what, what did we answer your question? Or do we well, address I, what, I guess what I was getting at is, what if I'm sure there's many municipal buildings that have natural gas boilers or fuel oil. Uh, those they are 4%, be, those are 3 to 4% of the, uh, of the uh, 
fuel use in town. And That's so it. we're talking, we're just thinking, okay, what about those boxes out there that people live in? Okay, well, that's what my question was. We're that's really it. I want to just stay focused on, okay, we got to figure out how to do, the, do these homes, which are going to be tough. Somebody else can figure out those other things. Those are going to be easier. <laughs> uh, so, and, you know, we have challenging facts like low fossil fuel prices. Homeowners are unfamiliar with heat pumps, satisfied with what they got. Heating systems last a long time. They probably last longer than heat pumps at last. Um, and some, a lot of homes are gonna need or benefit from uh, a deeper level of weatherization than just you know, filling a couple of, uh, of leaks. Um, now, CMLP is the opportunity. So whereas some things are difficult in uh, MLP districts like uh, putting up solar arrays potentially, um, because of our electricity price, we actually do have a segment where they can benefit from heat pumps. The, those are those 2,500 oil and propane heated homes. Um, and I think it would be great if five years from now we can say, look, we got rid of a lot of the oil that people were using. Boy, that's hard though, that's difficult. And uh, we'd start having to convert like I, uh, a number like a couple hundred homes a year in order, to, in order to do that in five years, over averaged over five years. You know, we should start slow, but, but that's kind of, that's the challenge. Now, CMLP, uh, I got the numbers from Jan Assetti the other day on how, what's been happening. And now this is a COVID pandemic year, so it's not, they're not doing as well as we could, but they did uh, a total of 38 uh, rebates for heat pumps this year. Not 250 or even 100. Uh, and the number of homes that got, um, that got weatherization rebates was eight. Um, and stuff like that. These are, were, they're, they're kind of nibbling around the edges. And granted it's COVID year and stuff like that, but it's not, uh, it's, they're very small numbers. And so doing, we have to, we have to kind of figure out, okay, what are the things we could do differently that would A, really help and also provide value because a lot of homeowners are not gonna answer the door figuratively unless they see you know, the town is doing something with some really good value for them. So you have to, we have to figure out messaging, what, what sort of uh, uh, thing we could provide of value. And it's not easy for us um, energy types to figure out what regular people need. Um, so just- um, Why well, we are regular people, Brad. Well, we're regular people, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're paying attention to this and we're losing sleep and stuff like that on this. <laughs> Out of curiosity, do you have a, a number for the number of applications that were rejected? Don't have that. Would be interesting. Um, good question. That number is available. Okay. I know who to call. All right. Um, now, uh, yeah. So the, um, so CSIC has done programs along these lines before on weatherization. They did the Green Year Heat program when I was just joining. And it was, they did 150 home weatherizations in one year out of a total of 450 assessments that were run. And that was a grant funded proposal. So this is kind of what we want to do a little bit on steroids or something, but uh, it's, um, you know, we can make an impact. We just have to uh, get our heads together and convince people, convince the town and convince uh, the residents of the town that we are doing something that's of value to them, I think. Uh, and so I just listed a few things. Um, I came up with a name, Concord Home Energy Transition, which I think is a horrible name and we need to have a better name that rings with people, but the acronym is, a, is the name of a trumpet player that I like. Um, 
the um, what I'm thinking is uh, I'm, I'm not going to do much more talking other than to say a few things. If we had in the next year, that if we could design a program in the first half of the next year and then uh, test it on a small set of people in the second half of the next year, and maybe COVID will be subsiding, hopefully, and we'll start getting back, then we could apply for funding for a larger program from, for example, that uh, grant opportunity that I mentioned, or there's other places. I don't know. I'm not very good with the grant stuff, but there might be other opportunities because this is going to cost some money. This is going to cost men, you know, this will have to be managed. It's going to have to have some professionals working on it, stuff like that. And um, we would need to, uh, one challenging is how to design a program with a really broad participation. Um, how do you get to everybody? Because there's so many people out there that are, they're in the rat race or they're not interested or they're happy enough with what they got. How can you convince them that, uh, hey, um, we could um, give you a plan for something you might do that satisfies the town goals and arguably reduces your costs and saves the planet at the same time. Um, and so um, there's a lot of missing pieces, um, including financing. Their financing is a big barrier for a lot of people. And uh, I mentioned it before and uh, figuring out how to do, how to fund this, um, stuff like that. I don't wanna monopolize this too much, but uh, maybe open this up to uh, discussing some of these points, get your ideas of um, what, what, where we as a committee or different members of our committee might say, I wanna work on, I wanna think about this and uh, you know, some, some part of this um, and congeal some thoughts in the next month or so. One of the things that you had said, Brad, you know, there was a starting place for some investigation, although it's it's a bit short sight in the longer term in terms of like what we're trying to do, is the idea of starting with the assessor's database right. and identifying those 2,500 homes that have oil and propane in them now, and right. then trying to use that set of people as a starting place to communicate. But even if we have that set, which we do through the assessor's database, we have no program to reach out to them with per se. It's prepared. Right. We have to uh, invent it. And, um... You know, maybe we should involve students, or maybe we should uh, hang things on doors, or maybe we should, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to get to, into the weeds of, of, of how to do it, but you're right. One of the, one of the areas that I, I, I found myself finding quite interesting, uh, in the last month, I collected a, a case study of a neighbor of ours that went through the process of putting in a heat pump and and his experience with it and the pros and cons of it. And um, to, have a, to have a reference source like that of people's experience, the case studies is, yep. is pretty powerful. Case studies, yeah. I mean, we've talked about that before. Uh, and I think Kate has some already, don't, don't you? I have a few, but that's actually something that I was talking with um, Jan at CMLP about is whether you all would be interested in collecting some more case studies about folks who have successfully transitioned to heat pumps. Um, because the, the more we have conquered examples, the better. Um, so I, I do think there's there's room for 
for more of those. I think that's a good sub project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of those are going to be uh, difficult case studies. Uh, but, you know, I, one of the things that might be useful is uh, how hard would it be to, I, I stumbled into this opportunity because I, I'm trying to make some assessments for myself. And it would be interesting to identify, sort of proactively identify a, a number of situations that haven't been documented and go after them in a standardized way of reporting what what happened. Um, yeah. I think you're thinking along the lines I'm thinking that uh, if you're going to collect a case study, you need to you need to have you, you need to know what you what what questions you're going to ask. Right. Uh, to collect useful information. And so somebody has to come up with that. Right, right, right. Yeah, I could definitely come up with a, with some kind of questions or like an outline of the kind of information that we would want in a case study. Thank you. Yeah. What, what happened, what I found myself, you know, running into when I just did this case study, I, I, it was kind of done off the cuff because I wanted to document it, what, what was in the house so that if I needed to compare it to another situation that I was in the process of evaluating, that I'd have enough information to begin to do that kind of comparison. And, um, you know, the size of the equipment that was used, the equipment labels that were used. I have photographs of the equipment labels that are in the house for the various parts of the system and um, the model numbers. And I'm not sure I collected the right information, but it was a start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it would be good to have a template so that if one person's collecting information about a situation and another person that they're on the same page. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think in the next month we could probably design that um, the set of questions and figure out how to uh, reach out to people. I know, I certainly know a lot of them from being on the heat smart list who's done what uh, who's done whole homes and or or partial homes um yeah that'd be great maybe brad maybe we can connect offline about that yeah because we want to find out are you are you comfortable are you using it do you think you're saving some money uh, but you're going to find some we're going you're going to find some that are paying that are that are not saving and you don't want to rattle the hornet's nest there. <laughs> the, the other thought I have is if you've really tightened up your house, you want some ventilation. So where does heat uh, energy recovery ventilation fit into this? Well, that, that you make a very good point because in the case study that I just did, Janet, um, one of the things that came out of the woodwork in that particular case was they tightened up their house with weatherization and triple pane window glass. And as a consequence of that, the scale and size of the heat pump that they ended up using was smaller and more efficient than what they would have used otherwise. And he, he said that was 50% of the solution easily. Wow, that's good. That's uh, yeah. nice job. Yeah, I, um, when I come over with the skis, let's go talk to your neighbor. Okay. Okay. Good. So, we're. Uh, um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm tired of people looking at my screen. What, what do other people think? I'm happy to talk to people. I, I like the idea of trying to develop some case studies. Having a outline would be very helpful. Yeah. We could have a, if we had a book of them, you could say, hey, your house is just like this one on page 23. 
Yeah, you? I mean, I've got this house situation, which is weird. It's hybrid, and I I hate it because it's not standard. It doesn't sort of be fall into a compliant situation because it has things that you can't do with a heat pump, you know, and uh, yeah, everybody's going to have some weird thing like that. Exactly what I was going to say. Like most places are going to have something that's sort of non-standard or a lot of places are going to have something okay. else. Good. Uh, I, I think those non-standard items are uh, case studies that could be particularly useful for those. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of in a similar situation as Doug, and I wonder about uh, how do I analyze this situation correctly? How do I take into account, you know, some of the these uh, oddities? And uh, just for example, just hearing that fifty percent observation. Um, that caught my ear, made me think about, you know, uh, how I'm looking at what I might do here. What, 50%? What do you mean? Your comment about uh, your neighbor saying 50% of his solution was uh, oh, weatherization. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I certainly expected that to uh, help, but to that degree? Like one of the things that he has in his house, as an example, is he has a portion of his house that uses radiant heat as a backup and it runs on a Renai heater which doesn't heat water to more than 140 degrees it's not a boiler right he can do that efficiently and not have to have a boiler and it also provides on-demand hot water so it's a partial solution that works pretty well and it was a, an effective solution and it, it's it's still using fossil fuel though. It's a backup. Yeah. It's only used like in the worst days. I don't know. I mean, the whole problem, the whole issue of having to have a backup source of heat when it gets cold like today, it's a reality. Yeah. But frankly, that's why I went geothermal because I just I didn't want to put an air source heat pump and then still have to buy a fossil fired furnace as backup, buy a brand new furnace that I hope to never use. So. And then you had to deal with the price consequences. <laughs> yeah, but then also all the equipment's inside. It's buried or it's inside, so there's no condenser coils to clog up or get leaves on or snow on or, you know, it's, it's working just fine right now with 15 inches of snow out there and air source heat pumps might not be. Case in point. <laughs> right. Right, but I anyway. think uh, I think it goes back to the model, right? The Brad, you know, we had that little discussion around how do you how do you come up with something simple enough so you don't have too many variables because the var more variables make it more complicated and it will be hard to convey the story. That's for sure. Um, okay. Especially if we're saying, well, I'll be happy. I'll tell you what. I'll 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 send around the, the I'll be sure, I'll send to the group the case study I wrote up, and it it's in it, call it draft form because it's the, I haven't shared it with many people, but this is a start. Hmm. Now, if we do a case, if we do a case study thing where we're interviewing people. And uh, we have a template for the interviews and stuff. I wonder if we should involve a student or two to help. That's a great opportunity for it's somebody. A good, it's a good experience. It's not hard to do, and it might make people really enjoy it. I don't know. You know what I would think might be an interesting way to connect into something, too, is the specialist at the abode place when they analyze houses for heat pump certification, yeah. they're going to have to have something like this too. Well, they're going to rely on the professional company doing a, the a manual J calculation or some estimate of heat load. I don't know. 
I'm not sure that that's well, what I mean. The that. difference is they're going to be going into situations that haven't been done yet, which uh, and what we're talking about are going to ones that have already been done where somebody took a, a risk and there's a result from it and we're reporting on the result. Right. Okay. Hmm. Okay. How do we organize this so that there's, somebody has a sense of like what to do? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, like I said, I'm happy to help draft something up, Doug, if you can share what you have, I can get what we already have and um, connect with Brad to figure out what I might, a good template might be, but we don't have to, we don't have to overthink or overcomplicate this. Right. right. Well, one, one thing that you may have going for you is like a, the deck houses in Concord. If you do a case study on a deck house, <laughs> that would be a good a good uh, baseline. Like Jerry right. and I both live in deck houses. Yep. There's all my neighbors have heat pumps on either side. Both my neighbors have heat pumps. Yeah. Yeah, that'll that'll get a lot of the peculiarities on the table. Right. I wondered too if, I mean, could we draw from other places experience too? I mean, I know what we're talking about Concord, but has anybody done this already? Is there a book of like this kind of thing that are recent that we could? I don't draw? know that you can get you. I, uh, I mean, there's MEEP has a lot of case studies in Northeast Energy Partnership. There are case studies, but I I just really think that people. Some we were, I was in a meeting earlier about heat pumps, and somebody said nobody cares what California is doing, and I I do think there's a there's a lot to that, like people want to see what other people in Concord, their neighbors have done and know that it works. Um, so I do, I think there's a lot of value in it coming from neighbor to neighbor. What about the experience in Maine where they've had a lot more penetration and conversions? Can't, do they, I know I saw something that I forwarded to Brad about that. Yeah. I mean, I think like there's many good case studies, right? Like we all know that heat pumps work in cold climates and that case has to be made for a lot of people. But, you know, people want to know like, well, what are the rebates available to me in Concord? What is it? How is it going to impact my electricity rate in Concord, right? And so we can capture those kinds of case studies that are really specific to Concord. I think that could be really helpful. Right. And, and these are all case studies of retrofit um, houses. That's a good place to start. Yeah. Because I mean, of the 2,500 houses that have oil that might be retrofit, I, I, what I'm thinking in my mind is like, wouldn't it, if, we, if we did some case studies for a couple of months, a month or two months, had uh, 10 or so that we could draw from, could we, would that put us in a place where we would then be able to better address talking to, or, I mean, maybe at the same time that we're doing the case studies, some of us should be looking at designing a, a package that could be sent or worked with to those 2,500 people. Well, how, how easy uh, is it to get the list of these 2,500 people? We have it. Right. Well, but... but so we have to be very respectful of people's time. So we can't approach, I don't think we can approach anybody until we're kind of pretty ready. We can't sort of start- Except we each can't. other. We, we can sort of, you know, try Exactly, out. exactly. We have friendlies, we can do that. We can uh, call them back and say, hey, what was, we've got to ask you a couple of questions, but you don't want to, uh, um, I, was just, I was just thinking it was, I didn't know we already had the names, but I was thinking of the homeowners. Um, I mean, does the boat have a name? You could do it in parallel, but since it's already done, then it's done. Would a, would a boat have an interest inherently in that 2,500 because they're probably the prime candidates for the heat pumps that they're going to be working with? Um, yeah, they... They've thought about a lot about this, and Travis, uh, um, you know, they 
they know a lot about market segmentation and how to uh, and stuff, and they don't even think. Um, I don't think they think that's their role here, but we'll find what, out next month. What do you think they think their role is? Uh, well, I don't know. They're not, I, I don't think they're in, in between CMLP and a boat. I don't think they're thinking that hundreds of people are going to be coming through a year. Uh, or that they're that they need to knock on doors. Hmm. I think they're thinking of that they'll do they'll do some promotion. They'll get some, uh, you know. I don't know. Well, let's find out next month. I, don't, I shouldn't. Sounds say good. So. But the We're, premise of what you're proposing, Brad, is that to have something that's town sponsored. Yeah. Right. So I think we, seems to me if we want to do that, we need to sort of design what the concept is and get the town buy-in before we start <laughs> right you know and i think the concept to me is a home energy plan you have this home uh do you have a good plan on on uh on you know what are the what are the the right things you can do um for the next 10 years or or whatnot uh, I don't know. I, I think that's a great question to ask. It's a great opening question. Right. Um, I, I have a little experience uh, professionally asking that question or a similar question. Okay. And it, it, it shocked people because it made them realize they're behind the curve. When they have no answer, it woke them up. Oh, okay. We've gone over time a little bit. I apologize. I oh, don't okay. want to extend this meeting beyond the 530 limit that we prompt that we're set to, to go to. Are there any other questions that we want to address or just we, we, we kind of have gone past the question and answer and public comment times? I apologize for that too. Um, are, are there any general question and answers that anybody wants to exp explore? Go ahead. Uh, do we have a date for our next meeting? The 21st of January at 3.30 to 5.30. Okay. Do you wanna um, ask for public comment? <laughs> do we have any? I have one, I have one other question on this. Um, and that's about biofuel oils or biodiesel that people can use for home heating as some kind of interim offering as part of this. Uh, is that something that Green Energy Consumers Alliance might be able to, to uh, bring you? I, I'm just throwing it out there. It's possible. <laughs> I don't know if they're doing, I don't as, know. They, as they a do. replacement to oil, fuel oil, you mean? Yes, that's my question. Has anybody heard of that? I've oh, heard I've of it. I've heard of it. I've <laughs> yeah, heard of it for years now. The car that runs on fish fry oil. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I still heat our home here with oil. Um, that's a story in itself. At any rate, uh, I inquired about this from uh, our oil provider, which is uh, Bursaw in um, Acton, and they commented that their standard offering blends in a certain amount of biodiesel. Or not diesel, but uh, uh, yeah. oil. Biofuel. Yeah. I don't know but, if that's what you that's the sort of thing you were you were asking about, uh, Bob. Yeah, maybe there's some providers out there that have a higher percentage that we could recommend. I, that's all I'm throwing out there that I believe me, I want to get off the burning things too, but <laughs> maybe there's some intra in, interim marketing things we could do. As part well, of this outreach, so it just—it's in, interesting you, you describe it that way. I, uh, my contract with Bursaw is through Green Con, Green Energy Consumers Alliance. There we go, another member. Yep, good folks. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe someone should look that up. I, I can look into that a bit, yeah. uh, and I'll distribute it to the group, I guess.
Great. Um, also, I just need to understand about, I have this opportunity that I'll be moving to Africa, but now it looks like it's going to be in February. So oh. what do I, um, I don't, I prefer not to resign, but I think I have to resign if I move overseas. I may be only overseas for a month. I don't know. Is there something that I can, uh, I don't know what the process is. If I'm away for two months or if I'm away for 14, I just don't know. Yeah. Well, we're going to get to some life thinking. <laughs> I guess when you no longer consider yourself a resident of Concord, you probably need to resign. But yeah, yeah, I would, I don't, we'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to check with the town clerk. But I would think if it was just short term and you were coming back, that you could stay on the committee. But um, long term, you might want to resign. It all comes down to you know if you're not available for meetings, it makes it can make it harder for um, the committee to have a quorum to meet. So I don't know how your internet connections would be from the middle of Africa. And you'd have so, a time difference too. Well, and Maybe the, we can just wait change. until you have a more clarity <laughs> okay. on your yeah. time. Yeah, frame. I'll have more, I should have more clarity shortly. Well, thank that you sounds for like at least exciting giving us a heads up on that. Yeah, yeah. 4 p.m. here is probably going to be what, midnight or 1? <laughs> That'd be 10, uh, 10 p.m., 4 p.m. Yeah. Oh, so Six hours time. right now. So. Six hours. Sure. You can join us still from Africa for the first meeting, and then you'll give us the lowdown. Right. Yeah, it's a lot of environmental work needs to be done there, especially on the power side. What part of Africa? That's a big... Niger, Niger. My wife has a job and mm -hmm. she's dragging me with her. <laughs> wow, that's that sounds exciting. Well, yeah. it's the poorest country on the planet, so you have to bring <laughs> food with you, believe it or not. Well, maybe we'll have a whole different set of environmental opportunities in that context. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean, there's opportunities galore there, I'm sure. They actually have a uranium mine. Maybe we can get them in a <laughs> reactor. They have a lot of sun too. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of opportunity for solar power. Well, is there any other public comments that need to be made? I don't think so. Okay, hearing none. I propose I, we should adjourn. Is that what you want next? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm seconding making... that. All right. Any, uh, so I move that we adjourn the meeting. Yeah, let's do it. It's already been adjourned and seconded. Okay. Okay. So, thank okay, you, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Happy holidays.